You're listening in on an animated discussion about Batman the Animated Series with two experts in their fields. I'm Joshua Unruh, superhero scholar. And I'm Caleb Masters, your friendly neighborhood film critic extraordinaire from the Cinematropolis.com. And today's topic is Season 2, Episode 9, The Strange Secret of Bruce Wayne. All right, Caleb, let's dive into this title card. I actually, Joshua, love this I title love card. This title I card. think it's better. I, I think it's better than the episode. And the episode, I think, is fine. But this title card is terrifying and effective. And to me, it reminds me like one of those old, like '80s John Carpenter posters a little bit. Yeah. Okay. We just got done talking about how the aesthetic of kung fu movies did not run into BTAS and give us a title card that we really loved. Right. right. It's okay. It's a little weird. It didn't really mesh. This one takes those pulp stylings or noir stylings that we've come to expect. And it does really ram it into that John Carpenter movie poster space. And it works like they are absolutely doing something that works on BTAS, but with some other kind of influence. Right. And it's great. And it's great. And it highlights the episode like, just, oh man, Bruce Wayne's got some stuff going on in there. What is it? Yet another noir style, sweaty close up. Mm-hmm. And I'll say, I don't know if they were doing this on purpose. I love the pupil as skull. Yes. It is a thing that was done often on a pulp character called Operator Number 5 on his covers. He had a skull ring that was important. I will not go into it, but there was often a skull pupil motif for Operator Number 5 covers, and it just makes me wonder if these guys are aware of that or if I'm just seeing things because I'm aware of it <laughs> right but it's cool it's as hell nice regardless little nod, yeah. yeah so uh I, yeah i think this is one of the better ones we've had right I, at least for me i think it's one of the, the stronger ones we've had recently and joshua i, I want to go ahead and lay out there the reason we did this episode i you asked me should we do this one i'm like yes we should because this is the only proper episode that dr hugo strange is in in any of the dcau and by the way he does make a cameo in an episode of the Justice League Unlimited, but he doesn't speak. And then they di- they were, had plans to use him and ditch them for weird reasons. Yeah. Yeah, there was a weird... I, I will actually research that more before we get to Justice League. Me too. But there were some reasons that they just stopped using Batman characters. Any Batman character that was not Batman, they just took off limits. And it's a little sad. It's a little too bad because there was definitely a lot of potential. He has a lot of potential. And then especially the context of that particular storyline in Justice League that we'll get to. It was really cool because it was like it felt like it was building off of everything in Mm -hmm. the DCAU that had come beforehand. And you're like, oh, man, this is super cool. Oh, and they're bringing back all these guys. We forgot were a thing. And while mixing in some new characters and it's all working together to kind of lead to this grand conclusion. So I was like, whoa, Doctor Strange, that's really cool. And then he never shows back up. Yeah. It's complicated. I, I wish he had because he is one of those really fascinating comic book characters who, in fact, I find him fascinating for a few reasons. And I, I'm going to, I will share a little bit with you because it well, segues little- into what I think is probably your most contact with him. It's so. Yeah, Let me give you a little just, of the background. Let's just just j- drive. Let's jump right into all the history on Doctor Strange. He shows up pretty early, 1940. Oh wow, that's yes. really early. It's very early. So within a year or two of publication, we've got Hugo Strange. When he initially shows up, his gimmick is that he is a mad scientist who turns people into monsters. Uh, in fact, he has monster men. That's what they're called. Um, This is probably best retold in a book called Batman and the Monster Men, where I've mentioned it before on the show. Matt Wagner, fantastic artist and writer, took a couple of the earliest Batman stories from like 1939 and 1940 that were 10, 12, 15 pages and blew them out into four, five, six issue stories and really let them breathe, right? Um, Introduced us to at the time, Bruce Wayne's fiance and deals with that relationship and why she's not around later. They are excellent and they're not my hard wreck for this episode, but they are just a general Batman recommendation. But that's it. He makes monster men. Okay? That's it. He makes people 
into monsters. So he's kind of like a generic Frankenstein kind of scientist character. Imagine a Frankenstein type character with Jekyll and Hyde shtick, right? Like he has a formula and it turns people into monsters. That's it. Along the way, he stumbles into a story where he discovers Batman's secret identity. This is just along the way. It's not a defining trait. He's just one of the few people who know it. However, this happened to occur close to when the entire DC Universe reboots. So they reboot the DC Universe in 1986 after Crisis of Infinite Earths. And when they reintroduce Hugo Strange, him being obsessed with Batman and discovering Batman's secret identity becomes his defining character trait, not the Monster Man. Okay. That stuff gets left off. Interesting. Yeah. And in between these things... He's a real kind of weird mastermind kind of soap opera-ish type character. Right. You may recall he's a ghost in the Laughing Fish story That's from the right. comics. That's right. We talked about that. Yeah, yes. he's part of the long game soap opera stuff that they were doing. So he's done a lot of stuff. So that's one of the reasons I find him super fascinating. He starts out with one shtick, and because of a almost in passing character moment when the universe gets rebooted, that becomes the thing we all focus His on. His defining shtick. And I feel like that goes into the thing you're probably most familiar with him. Let me guess. Arkham City? Yeah, Arkham City. He, yeah. Because he actually has not appeared in any of the films, save for he's not appeared in any of the live-action films. Mm-hmm. He does make a cameo in the recent Lego Batman movie. That's right. And but so does everybody. I, exactly. Condiment King yeah. was in Batman <laughs> Lego movie. So. God, that movie's great. And uh, also he made an appearance in the recent Gotham by Gaslight uh, movie as the head of... Arkham. He was over Arkham. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. It, it, he was, uh, that was kind of the role he filled for Young Justice also. Right. Because he was a psychiatrist in, that was one of his many things that he was when he was making Monster Men. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, and he, I mean, he, the way he dresses looks like more of a traditional psychiatrist vibe. And we're going to throw in a German accent, so you've got a very Freudian kind Freudian, of thing yeah, going on. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. It makes sense. But yes, Arkham City, the video game, that's the sequel to Arkham Asylum. This is the second game in the Arkham trilogy. Uh, the last one was Arkham Knight, which came out on the PS4 and Xbox One. Yeah, and in that game, which is, again, the way those story those games work is they combine a lot of different stories mm-hmm. and all these different characters. But the whole thrust of that game is that Dr. Hugo Strange knows Batman knows his identity, and lures Bruce Wayne into Arkham. Which has become uh, they, three square miles yes, yes, of they, the city. They like, yeah, they, it's somehow Dr. Hugo so Strange, it, it, does, it, it doesn't make any sense, <laughs> but somehow Dr. Strange persuades the city. There's actually, in fact, I want to say it was a comic, it, comic or I think it was a comic or a web series where they like did a lead up to okay. how this I whole thing I appreciate that they made the effort. Yeah, I think it was like a six issue series, comic book series about how Hugo Strange somehow convinced Gotham to do, you know. I guess when 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 Hamilton Hill's your mayor, I guess it's, you know, it's pretty easy to do. (laughs) Yeah. So so basically, they yes, they take, like, I think three or so miles of Gotham. They're like, you know what? Let's just, let's just throw, we're going to build these walls and we're going to throw all the criminals in this spot and we're going to let them kill each other or whatever. And the entire point of this thing is so that Hugo Strange has a place to lure Bruce Wayne into. Exactly, yes. It is classic, it's insane. It's fantastic yeah. supervillain stuff. Like, that is some big-level thinking. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. And over-the-top, theatrical, just like that. And it's like because Batman. he's obsessed with Batman and this identity switch between Batman and Bruce Wayne. Right. And so, uh, with the Matt Wagner take, um, he is actually fascinated with Batman because he is a essentially perfect physical specimen. And and Hugo Strange is not right. Like he's short and he's not attractive, but he's done everything he can to make himself as good as he can be. Oh this, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. He get, yes, he gets like ripped and stuff. Yeah, he like yeah. body builds and stuff. But yeah, he's just a weird looking dude. And I think in City, in Arkham City, it was a little more the psychology. The you oh, are yeah. two, oh you are two people. We'll do the you know. Um, but it's great. I lo- yeah, I love all of that. And he's a really good villain in that thing. Yes, he is. He yeah. is. And now he was the one that was over uh, all over the marketing materials and played up in the trailers mm-hmm. and things like that. Um, that game had, like, of course, tons of villains. The Joker still ends up being kind of the main bad guy. Yeah. I mean, in as much as anybody is, because that thing is 
bonkers. Oh yeah, well, because Ra's al Ghul shows up out of nowhere and has a has a subplot, and I was like, what? And gets a well. Spoiler. Oh, it's crazy. I love yeah. it. I mean, I, I, I well, love the how, well him and, and how well, bonkers it got. Because that yeah. oh oh because that's the other thing. I guess this is kind of spoilers <laughs> for Arkham City, which is a game that came out like what eight years ago now. Stop listening now uh, if you don't want to know. But uh, that's the thing because Hugo Strange got his resources from the League of Shadows, right? Yeah, Wait, this was because this was a team effort that we didn't know about until like halfway through the game. Sure, yeah, yeah that, because I, there's an entire World's Fair and a Lazarus Pit underground. Yes, of course, yeah, underneath Gotham, under the part of Gotham that just so happens to have, wait for it, the Iceberg Lounge. Yes, a museum of uh, natural history. Yes, the theater where Bruce Wayne's parents were murdered. Yes, a foundry. Yes. And a conservatory, I think, where There's a Poison Ivy is holed up. Yeah, she's in the game. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, there you go. it's in the same three square miles. Yeah. Is there anything left in the rest of Gotham? I don't anyway. know. I don't know. Yeah, no. It's anyway. It's a good time. Uh, which we'll my... soft wreck. That's not our wreck at the soft end wreck, of the thing, but, but we'll soft wreck but that, that game. I think as far as Hugo Strange, as far in in popular Batman fiction, that's the biggest spotlight he's gotten probably in the last. Yeah, definitely. Or ever, I'd say ever. Other yeah. than that, yeah, honestly, because because that game got a huge marketing push and a lot of. A lot of people i'd say just as many people played that game as watched this episode probably oh yeah Pr- uh, certainly yeah yes so that's probably where most people would recognize hugo strange from so he's probably not used to his fullest i would say in this episode but that's why we're talking about him because he does loom surprisingly large in the pop cultural consciousness yes he, I, he's a char- he's a character it's really weird because he's not used very often but I do feel like people talk about it. he comes up yeah. enough that you're like, oh yeah, he's the guy who knows Batman's secret. So that and that that gimmick is so strong that he does stay around. Because I remember uh, one of the podcasts I listened to way back before there were bajillions of podcasts. <laughs> they were talking about the Dark Knight Rises before we knew anything about the yeah. movie, and they're like, who's the next villain? And one of the guys was like, Hugo Strange, it's gonna be Hugo Strange. And he was just talking about. Every that time, been, you know, that was kind of my pick for the first one before I realized what they were doing with uh, with Jonathan Crane. Ooh, yeah. I mean, because again, you're you're talking about psychologist, psychiatrist they working merge the in Arkham. Characters a little they bit kind there. of a little bit, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that's very cool because that's the other thing is that um, uh, over time, again, this is kind of an aggregation of character stuff. He does become very synonymous with Arkham. Oh yes, you know that was the Young Justice angle. That was the Arkham City angle. Not so much this one, but yeah, pretty big deal. And there's a lot of fun stuff in this episode, and we get some things that you and I always love. The internal look at Bruce yes. Wayne's psyche. Yes, um, and hey, we and we get super villain stuff. Uh, so a it's super worth hero, about. Uh, sorry, super villain team up. Yeah, yeah, uh, it was a lot of fun. I think there's a lot to like here. Uh, so we just want to go ahead. I think Hugo Strange is, of course, the big character. So I think mm-hmm. it's. I think we're fair to jump right into the story. Although, now I agree, and I'm going to say, did you catch the other ongoing villain that they mention as part of the Hugo Strange plot? No. The resort is owned oh, by yes. Roland Oh, yes. Oh, Roland Daggett. Daggett. Yes, I did catch that. I did catch that. Yes. Roland Daggett owned the resort. I was just like, Daggett again. I, yeah, I know. I was. I had the same reaction. Yes, I made a note about that. He's yes. not in the episode. He's not in the episode. But of course, Daggett, who has all the awful things ever in Gotham, right. owns this resort which in which a doctor... Hugo Strange works at and and, and where they are monetizing blackmail. blackmail. Like that is that yeah. is literally the point of the resort is to be a nice enough resort to lure high profile Gothamites so that they can be blackmailed later. Mm, it sounds about like Daggett. I, I think I think it sounds like a Daggett <laughs> sort of thing. That's a that's a great find. Uh, so th- of course the the story you know starts off. Uh, he discovers this because. Uh, the intro to this was actually pretty strong because you have this judge who's like trying to like jump off a bridge, which right. I was like, "Ooh, this is getting heavy all fast." Yeah. First, you don't know who she is, but you're like an older woman who's clearly becomes pretty obvious is at a clandestine meeting of some kind, and she's very worried. And then Batman happens to be there, which later we we get a line where Bruce Wayne. Well, it's not Bruce Wayne. We'll talk about it in a minute, but that judge vargas and bruce wayne are friends right and so it kind of makes sense that batman would be she's acting strange i'll keep an eye on her you know we've talked about this before there's a lot of uh how did batman come to this place we don't really talk about it we just pick it up where this story needs to pick him up mm-hmm. he's got a lot of irons in the fire he's investigating a lot of things and one of your highest profile judges acting weird withdrawing all of her money right i can imagine these are things that would blip on his radar right and here he is so it's a strong start and it's going back to that uh who was the show made for conversation that we have every right. now right blackmail plot i love it 
but not. I don't think our kids a 10, gonna, 11, 12 year old kid kind of thing. I don't right? think they're gonna get it. Like they're gonna understand the principle, but are they gonna understand? Wow, this person is jumping off a bridge because they're just yeah they're being I held, held held hostage. I mean, clearly the rest of the episode holds together enough, and this may be why they decided to write this to a point where several supervillains show up because it's like okay now we've got to hit the gong for the 10 year olds bring in right. three supervillains <laughs> but yeah it's a fat it's a fascinating I, I, start i actually do think they do that a little bit with the supervillain uh piece they they bring in the supervillains to kind of like fluff it up make it a little yeah. lighter so that I mean, and i am not personally just, thankful for it oh yeah me too it makes it more I think fun a straight hugo strange blackmail plot would have wound up being kind of boring on its own well, merits. Because he's, he's not a super flashy bad guy there's no signature beat has set piece right mm-hmm. with with hugo strange what are you gonna do so let's bring in not one not two right. but three of the rogue to yeah. step that up about 10 notches yes I- exactly and i'm actually really glad you mentioned the uh the rogues because this is the first time we actually have a proper villain team up mm-hmm. uh on batman the animated series we'll see a lot more of them in the future but we get the joker uh, who's always great, Mark Hamill, you, you Two Face, and the Penguin. Uh, one thing I noted that, that, that I really appreciated was they all had when they were off getting off the plane, they all had very specific music cues. Yes, uh, yes. I read the Two Face one was the way one was like, oh man, that's a cool play because they don't use that theme very often at all. Each of them exit the plane in a very personality specific way yes. with their own theme music. It's really good. Yes, it's really yeah. good. It definitely kind of harkens back to our discussion with Alexandra about how sometimes the Riddler can fall into a two Joker space. Right. And not that this was as much in danger with these three, but it shows that these guys understand the creators of the show understand we have to differentiate these guys. Right. We need to know each of their personalities right now. Yeah. You never, uh, you never mistake the, the Joker and two face, uh, again, because the very distinct personality Mm -hmm. things. And I think that's, that's one thing the show gets really well, um, I, I do really appreciate the way that uh, little things, little things like when they're waiting for them to roll to play the tape, the Joker's just sitting there eating popcorn. <laughs> Focus. Focus. So, yeah. Joker actually had a lot of really good jokes he, in this he episode. Did. He did. I got a lot of laughs out uh, of it. Yes. Yeah, he did. And also um, towards the end, he's got the uh, uh, junior crunch. What it, like the it's clearly a cereal prize. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, that yeah, is yeah. his junior airman badge. Ju- yes, it, it, it quite funny. I loved his costume. I love how they 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 change his costumes. No explanation. Uh, also, <laughs> that's this, right because he gets the whole scarf and, yes. and bomber jacket thing going. Yeah. And uh, by the way, this is also the, his first appearance since the laughing fish, and they don't really take any time to explain how he survived at all <laughs> again nope. just, just like we said earlier like oh here he is <laughs> we didn't think he was dead anyway oh no 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 um but yeah that was super fun i liked the back and forth uh and it was a pretty clever guy i wasn't sure it's not, it's not that i didn't know batman was gonna get out of it but i couldn't remember how he faked them out right you know it was it was, re- it was really clever so he went in created a different tape where he imagined his worst fear or his guiltiest thing was you go strange that's right. He created it's it. Hugo Strange making a plot to steal money from three supervillains. Yes. Smart plan. Very smart plan. <laughs> and he's like, no, it's the wrong tape. And before he can play it, they shoot it out of his hands. I love And Joker's response to that. You're telling me. Like, <laughs> Batman using his brain to solve the problem, right? Like to not just cover up for his secret identity, but also to put Hugo Strange in the hot seat. Right. Well, you know me. I love the secret identity shenanigans. I love the fact that he decided to use Bruce Wayne as the vehicle through which he would investigate. Right. You know, that's yes. great. And then got in a little over his head because of it in a very believable way. Well, see, and he thought he was sitting on a gold mine, but really he just dug his grave. Yeah. He's like, oh, I'm going to blackmail the richest guy in Gotham, but oh my gosh, he's Batman. Well, I'm going to sell this to the highest bidder. Yeah. But then he's like, he he, he, he kind of, like you said, got in over his head. Now he's dealing with real supervillains who don't mess around. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're yes. actually psychologically damaged people. <laughs> I love the supervillain team up. And my favorite part of it for me watching this episode was that they were so antagonistic of one another right up until Hugo Strange was a thing for all three of them to focus on. Right. And I mean that both positive and negative because they decide to just pool their money. That was funny too. When they're trying to bid in Joker's like, no, 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 let's just go all in. We all want the bat. We all want it. So as soon as they have one thing to focus on and then when it becomes a negative thing for Hugo Strange, when it's like, Oh, you're not actually in our club. 
the supervillain club is actually very exclusive in Gotham. We're going to get you. Yeah, yeah, you you're know. you're not one of us. Just because you had this information doesn't mean... And I, I also love how they reveal that he, he still says, oh, no, it's Bruce Wayne, I promise. And the two faces like, oh, I know Bruce Wayne. He's not Batman. <laughs> That, okay, you have layers. Like, that's an accidental one. Like, that's not one Bruce Wayne could possibly have engineered. Right. But you do have all these layers where by the end of it, I'm pretty sure Hugo Strange doesn't think he knows Batman's secret identity. No, no, it's really great because by the end, it's like a head fake, right? It, it's, it's, a, it's a head fake because Bruce Wayne, air quotes, uh-huh, Bruce uh-huh. Wayne shows up and he's like, no, wait, but you're Batman. But you're Bruce Wayne. I have the tape. So maybe he's questioning now. He's like, wait, did I? Maybe he... I just misinterpreted the, the well, and the you dream. have and you have Dick pretending to be Bruce, saying I agreed to help Batman, so I imagine that on purpose, so that all this would happen, which only makes a certain amount of sense. But at the same time, at the end of the day, no one's gonna look what just happened here. Yeah, no, no, it, it's all a, it's all a brilliant uh, head fake for Doctor Hugo Strange. We should probably talk about the vision of Batman, the interiority. Yes, we love that thing. We love it when this happens on the show, and we've talked about all the fun things. So we can we can kind of like draw to a close. I think it gets kind of it gets intense. The very serious stuff. Yeah, it gets intense. Uh, it, it cuts. To, we actually do. I think this is probably one of the only times we see the death of the Waynes. We get pretty close. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I really like. It's a memory, right? So it's not like a video of the thing happening. It's how he, how he remembered it. it. So it's very like things loom and it's lots of clouds, and then it becomes this flock of bats and cover up the moon, turns into a bat signal, hand, I wanted revenge. Revenge. You know? I, I I think that, well, and that's a very important thing to, to underline because we talk a lot about mm-hmm. like Batman and his relationship with revenge, and I thought it was really a really powerful moment, and you're like, oh boy, this got real dark for your again, children's programming. <laughs> now, um, I want to say, I want to point out a couple of things to support my ongoing thesis that revenge is not really the point. It's past tense. I wanted revenge. I'm just saying. Sure, sure. The other thing uh, that I found wonderful is we saw soundlessly but we saw the vow yeah no i saw that i actually made a note about that in my uh, as well like we 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 see the vow we see child bruce wayne raising his fist in the air that is the the one of him at the grave i i mentioned before that you usually see this in one of two ways like it's a literal candlelight vow that he's making sort of like in his bedroom in his nighttime prayers Mm -hmm. or he is you know, beating his fist into grave dirt, swearing, you know, to his parents. And this was very much influenced by the beating his hand into grave dirt version. And I love it. Yeah. It's, it's really good. Powerful imagery. Powerful imagery for sure. Uh, yeah, I, I think it was a very effective sequence. Probably mo- the most effective of the episode. Highlighting. Yeah, yeah. Outside highlighting of the what stuff, the, it's the best part. The anger yeah. he felt like as a child that drove yes, him to be Batman. Yeah. And of course he did. Like, of course he did. And of course, we've talked about the survivor's guilt that he carries that is completely irrational, and he knows it, but he has it anyway. And Hugo Strange pulls it right out of him. Mm-hmm. I mean, and and it's interesting how quickly, and I know, I think we can see kind of textually, Bruce Wayne feels that this machine is getting in his head somehow. It's making him more willing to talk about stuff because he's angry right away. What's What happened to my parents is public record. Yeah, like he's exactly. He's very defensive very right defensive. away. Um, and, it's, and it's really, he's mad. Right off, because this thing is like poking into that. He doesn't. He doesn't want to talk about it. He doesn't want to. Yeah, exactly. This is this is something that he does. He's compartmentalized. Yeah, you know, and it's a a part of his brain. Probably in a large again talking about Batman, a largely healthy way. Like, why would I constantly dwell on this very tragic moment, like over and over, and just really think really hard about it? Right, it's not healthy. You deal with it and then stop doing that. You know, I'm not a mental health professional and I'm being very reductive, but, uh, you, know, you know, I mean, it's just one of those things like he, he's put it away. It's in a part of his brain that he doesn't, you know, yeah. have to deal with anymore. Yeah. And c- because, again, like I say, why would you? It's awful. Why would you want to just think about that all the time? Think about the good times. Remember your parents a certain way. Yeah. Well, Joshua, I, I want to go ahead and just throw out uh, that. I don't think this is the greatest episode, but I do think it, it warrants a watch. I think it does. Yes, I, I, think I agree. It's the only Hugo Strange episode in the series and the fun we have with the other villains. Absolutely. Uh, and then the, the scene, you know, the, the scene we see, uh, we just talked about where we actually get inside the mind of Bruce Wayne again. Great. Sequence. Justifies justifies your 22 minutes. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'll I, say also, just as a side note, like a comic book guy thing, uh, the secret identity covering switcheroo at the end 
has a long and storied history Ooh. in Batman comics, especially Batman and Superman comics. I cannot tell you the at least dozens and probably hundreds of times that Superman has worn Batman's costume so he could stand hey, next to Bruce Wayne. There's an episode in, yeah. in uh, the Adventures of Batman and Robin or whatever yep. that yep. this happens. Yeah. It's great. And it's, it's lots of fun. To fool Lois, to fool Lex, to fool somebody. I can't tell you how many times that thing. Um, in the 90s, after the death of Superman, when they finally brought him back, they had Martian Manhunter pretend to be Clark Kent, like morph himself into Clark Kent and put himself underneath a bunch of rubble so Clark Kent could be found and not be dead anymore. Right, because because they had been assuming Clark Kent was dead. Right, because so much of Metropolis was destroyed. Leveled in in the thing that Into caused reporter. Superman to be dead. Yeah, and then it was like, no, I was just they're still finding people, and they get Martian Manhunter who can actually shapeshift to do that switch route. It's very in passing. It's the very end of the thing. They don't spend a lot of time on it. But for a person who has been reading comic books his whole life, I was like, I really appreciate that you yeah, guys. It's a nice nod for <laughs> sure. Uh, so before we close out, uh, what, let's talk about some of our alternate media recommendations, Joshua. And I've got several for you. I was thinking a lot about dreams okay. and memories. Okay. First up, original Total Recall. Oh, sure. A machine making you confront your worst memories and then someone using that to manipulate your reality. Yeah, that's great. That's excellent. It's yeah. a super fun movie. You got to check it out. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Classic. Uh, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Oh, also a good pick for yeah, that angle. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's another one that deals a lot with memories and the fallibility of memories and also how memories can drive where you're at today. Uh, the Manchurian Candidate was one that okay. when we put the guy with Bruce in the machine, I was, I don't know, something about yeah, like yeah, the, yeah. the guy poking around in the machine to blackmail someone and brainwash someone. Yeah. And then uh, lastly, we'll go ahead and throw a really uh, more art house film, uh, Fellini's Eight and a Half. Okay. Yeah. For your people who are really hardcore film people who want to get into art house cinema, it's one that's about dreams and how they influence your day-to-day -day and help you confront uh, things of the past or maybe not confront them. That's fantastic. What do you think? It's especially fantastic because I took a very different tactic, and my recommendation is based on blackmail. Yes! It's a tenuous connection, I admit. But if I'm going to talk about a blackmail story that brings me endless joy, I think you should watch Clue. Communism is a red herring. Communism is just a red herring. First of all, that movie is hilarious from top to bottom. It really is. And it is all these people's horrible secrets being held over their heads. That is the impetus for this story that unfolds. And, I mean, they don't stay secret very long, obviously, but that's what puts them all in this position. And uh, so it, it's treated in a much lighter fashion, obviously, but the Damocles sword of your horrible secrets hanging over your head and costing you your livelihood and then let's laugh about it i say clue that's my vote uh clue's a great a great pick and you I, I have to recommend that you find the dvd of that because there are three alternate endings that was a fat okay so fascinating tidbit i saw clue in the theater as a young, much younger person and i only got to see one of the endings right and so when it came out they, they released it regionally this was a thing that could happen before the internet it's pretty would, brilliant. It's amazing because you might get different endings in the board game, right? So much more thought went into Clue than all, any other uh, than your battleship it, or such. I really wish there was a movie that came out like that today because we have the internet. It would create such an interesting conversation. It would be fascinating, right? Yeah. Because regionally, like, I mean, you and I were both in Oklahoma. How often do we talk to California people? I mean, we sometimes. I mean, sometimes, yeah. but like, but not necessarily about this random movie choice that I made, right? Exactly. This board game movie. Are we all going to yes. get excited about that? Yes. Now look. The cast in this movie is amazing. So if they did a similar cast today, I probably would. I, get I really about hope it. someone experiments with it in the but same it was, way. But yeah, it, at the time especially, it was just amazing. And I, I don't remember the details, but I remember it taking a minute for critics to realize that they had seen different versions different of the movie endings. Yeah, because yeah. again, this is before the internet, and not every critic is reading every critic's review. Well, in the in your review, you're not talking about the ending of the movie either, not right? Usually, yeah. So, yeah, so it's it's got a little bit of an interesting historical context, but also it's hilarious and blackmail. Yes, clue. clue. I, I second that recommendation. Well, that about 
about wraps up this animated discussion. Caleb, where can people go to continue the conversation with you? Well, Joshua, you can always find me on Twitter talking about film, television, video games, and all sorts of other pop culture goodness at C Masters Talk. That's letter C Masters Talk. I'm also the editor in chief and film critic at The Cinematropolis. And we publish these in-depth essays on all types of different films, oftentimes including science fiction, and superhero films, all the stuff you'd want to read about. And you can find all these articles at thecinematropolis.com. Joshua, what about you? I'm also most active on Twitter, where you can find me easily enough at Joshua Unruh. And remember that an animated discussion is a Pulp Diction Productions program and is 100% supported by listeners like you. To find out how you can keep this and our other shows in production, check out patreon.com slash Pulp Diction Productions. And join us next time to investigate how Batman terminates the robot apocalypse in a heart of steel. And guess what? It's a two-parter. It'll be episodes 10 and 11 of Batman the Animated Series Season 2. Until next time, we'll see you back here. Same bat time, same bat channel. <laughs>